tell you, at the start of this, I was I was nervous because life groups really weren't my thing. And I remember to this day, like my very first words were like, I'm lost. And so I kind of experienced my walk in isolation. It's changed the way that I see things now, especially the responsibility that we have as Christians. Throughout my whole life, I've struggled with pride. Uh, it's manifested itself in many different ways, but one of which was not being able to let go of a problem. I was hesitant, but something was heavy on me. Like, it really was. It was weighing on me. I needed these people to bring me closer to God. That's exactly why I joined. You know, as long as I read my word, as long as I'm praying, I'm good. But it's more than that. It's about inviting people to experience God in their lives. I really feel now like I'm li living in community, and I like that. It also showed me a, a better way of identifying who I am in Christ. We had a chance to kind of confess, and I shared with them about pride, and my wife and I had been struggling with a problem, and I couldn't solve it. For me, um, it just opened up so many things to help me get closer to the Lord, and I feel it's because I confessed it. I feel like this Rooted group has definitely helped me understood that, you know, I'm loved by God, and I don't, need to be loved by anybody else. I don't need to find that validation from anybody else. He's enough. He's enough for me and I'm satisfied with that. Words cannot actually capture how thrilled I was to see the way in which God used Rooted in 2019 to ground our church. And I cannot even begin to articulate to you how excited I am for Rooted in 2020. Listen, you need to go register ASAP. This is a 10-week discipleship journey that will ground you in the Word of God, will allow you to ask hard questions, will allow you to understand God's purpose and plan for your life. It's Rooted, Rooted, Rooted. And it is founded, if you will, right from the Word of God in Ephesians chapter 3, where the Bible says this, for this reason... I kneel before the Father from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. And I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. Here it is, church, listen in. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have the power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ and to know this love that surpasses knowledge. Let me just challenge you to go register for Rooted ASAP. In fact, you can actually register right now in this worship celebration. Just simply pull out your phones and text get rooted no spaces to 59769 or you can go online to newhopechurch.org forward slash rooted why don't you give yourself a great christmas gift this year and get engaged in rooted discipleship starting in january 2000 and 20. Hey, I'm so glad you're here today. I'm with my boy, Wesley Jacob Kelly, who is a student at the Citadel. I'm gonna try to get him moved back here for Christmas, but I'm so glad you are here in church today because you are in for a treat as Pastor Keith, or as I like to call him, Coco Butter. That's kind of his stage, spoken word, rap name. Barreto from the Wake Forest campus is with us today. And I know he's no stranger to this stage, but I just wanted to say to the Wake Forest community of faith, I know you guys love when he's up here teaching, but I wanted you to know, on behalf of the entire movement, I wanna thank you for graciously allowing your campus pastor to come to Durham and preach the word of God. So New Hope, you're in for a treat. Grab your pens, grab your teaching notes, open up your Bible or your app, whatever the case may be, and let's go get this second installment of our Christmas series foretold. Today, we're talking about the prophecy in the Old Testament of Jesus being a king, and it's going to be good. So why don't you do what you always do? Come on, give it up and welcome my brother, our friend, Keith Barreto. Here we go, church. New Hope, what's up, everybody? What's up? 
Are you ready for the Word of God today? Come on, I said, are you ready for the Word of God today? Hey, help me welcome all of our campuses. I'm talking about Garner. Come on, keep it going. Hillsboro, Sanford, Columbia. Help me welcome all of our Kenya campuses. Everybody watching online, please help me welcome our Wake Forest family, everybody. And I am glad to be in the house of God today. Let me just ask you guys a question. Is anybody excited about this Christmas series? All right, there we go. Hey, so last week, we were about to start part one of Foretold at our campus, and about an hour before the celebration started, we lost power in Wake Forest. Yeah, so we had to go acoustic, but because we have some powerful world changers at our campus, we went ahead and transformed the cafeteria. We had church over there in Wake Forest, and we went ahead and had a candlelight service, Christmas Eve celebration without the candles. Uh, it was powerful. But you know what was really cool, though, is I was able to go on our New Hope YouTube channel, and I was able to go and see Pastor's message, and man... Our pastor can preach, can he? Listen, there's a confidence to know that if you invite a first-time guest to come to church, your pastor is going to bring the Word of God consistently every time. That is worth celebrating. Come on, let's celebrate the man and the woman of God. I can tell you, I've been on the other end too before where like you're wondering what pastor's gonna preach and so you're calling him the night before. You're like, uh, hey, pastor, uh, I got a friend coming. What are you preaching on tomorrow? Because <laughs> you just don't know. But man, I'm so thankful to be able to have a pastor that preaches the word of God. It, it is so important. So hey, I've got a confession to make. And that is, I am a Christmas junkie. We have any Christmas junkies in the house, right? Like... It's the most wonderful time of the year. I, I, singing's not my thing, but I'm telling you, it is the most wonderful time of the year. I've even got Christmas socks on, believe it or not. Like, and, and I love watching Christmas movies. You can ask my family. I've had uh, Louis Armstrong Christmas holiday playing since before Thanksgiving. <laughs> I, they're just constantly playing. But one of my favorite movies has got to be, hands down, Christmas Vacation. Have you guys seen that one? You guys remember your cousin Eddie? Right, remember cousin Eddie? He was that, just that good old boy coming up out of the hills and he had that rusted out RV that he drove into that nice suburban neighborhood and he shows up to his brother-in-law's house unannounced and he stays for like a month. And, and what was so funny is you could tell he was like a man of faith because he was trusting that his brother-in-law was going to buy all of his Christmas presents for his family and for himself. Cousin Eddie was a riot. And you could tell that he probably wasn't playing with a full deck either, right? <laughs> Remember when, when, when Cousin Eddie, there he is right there, right? So, so we did this Christmas series at our old church called Everyone Loves a Cousin Eddie. Uh, everyone, everyone has a Cousin Eddie, and there I am right there. It was, uh, it was legit. I came out with the dicky on and everything, right? <laughs> Uh, because Cousin Eddie was comical, and, and he wasn't playing with the full deck, so I remember Clark in the movie, he was hoping for that Christmas bonus. Remember, he was going to put that swimming pool in there, and he didn't get it. Instead, he got that certificate to the Jelly of the Month Club, and he was like, I could tell you what I'd like to have right now. I'd like to have my boss right here, right now, so I could tell him a thing or two, and his crazy brother-in-law goes out and kidnaps his boss and brings him back. <laughs> Now, now, we say that, but listen, you think about this. When, when, when God was about to send his son to the world to be the king of kings and the Lord of lords, you would have thought that he would have sent Jesus to the most prestigious, royal, flawless family with a stellar reputation. But if you go down into Jesus' Ancestry.com in Matthew chapter number 1, and you look into the genealogy of Jesus, you will see that he had a couple of Cousin Eddie's in the family. <laughs> he had people in his family like Rahab the harlot, who was a prostitute. He had people in his family like Jacob, who was a hustler and a trickster. Anybody have any hustlers in the family? No, no, you don't have to put your hands up. Don't put your hands up. <laughs> 
had people in his family like King David, who King David saw a woman taking a bath one day and wanted to have her as his wife and found out that it was his friend Uriah's wife and he had Uriah killed in battle so that he could have his wife to be his own. I mean, that's some Game of Thrones stuff right there. You know, all in Jesus' family tree. He had people in his family like Solomon. Now, Solomon was a great king full of wisdom, but that man was a womanizer. I mean, the man had 700 wives and 300 concubines. Good God, what a, what a man want with a thousand women in his life. That brother back there is like, amen. Like, no, 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 that's not amen. No, that's oh me. You don't want to have that many women in your life. See, see, now why would God allow his son to come into a family tree as jacked up as this? And I could tell you why. It was because this king was going to be different than all the other kings that would come before him. This king would not seek fame. This king would not seek fortune and the accolades of men. This king was going to be different. This king would not seek to put the position above the people. This king would come and put the people above the position. This king wasn't coming to be served. This king was coming to serve. Now, having that as the backdrop for today's message, let's go get this word today. Are you ready for the word of God? Yeah. Let's jump down into the book of Isaiah, chapter number nine. We're going to look at verses six through seven, and then we're going to look at John, chapter number one, verses 10 through 12. Now, you'll have these on your teaching notes. I want to encourage everybody in the room and those who are watching online, let's read this thing with a Christmas spirit. Come on, let's go get this. Isaiah 9, verse 6 says, let's read together. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing it and upholding Holding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. Whoo, that's powerful right there. Now let's jump down into John 1. Let's start in verse 10. Come on, you are doing well. All over our campuses, I just know I can feel it. Come on, let's read this thing together. Verse 10 says, He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become the children of God. Amen. May God add his blessing to the reading of the word. Now when you hear that, who is his own? The nation of Israel, that was his own. God's chosen people. God's chosen people who are mentioned all the way back in the book of Genesis with Abraham, the father of the faith. God's chosen people, Israel, who had received the laws of God, who had received the prophecies of the coming king that would come from heaven upon the earth. And the Israelites had faithfully communicated that message and passed it down from generation to generation to generation. They had been waiting on the Messiah, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And Jesus comes down and he steps on the scene and they have Jesus right in front of them. He is healing the sick. He's raising the dead. He's opening blinded eyes. He's making deaf ears come open. He is walking upon water. He's speaking to the winds and to the waves and commanding the sea to lie down. He is doing miracles right before them, fulfilling prophecy, and they missed him. And verse 11 says, and he came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Now, after reading all this, 
You might ask, how in the world could they have missed Jesus? See, at this time, Rome was the ruling army. Rome had invaded Israel. They had taken over Israel. And now Israel was actually living under the Roman occupation. Rome was ruling the world. And because they had the prophecy that we just read, that a king would come and would liberate them. He would come and establish his kingdom upon the throne of David. They looked at that and they saw Jesus upon the cross and they missed him and said, he probably probably isn't the one, and they missed the entire Old Testament sacrificial lamb that would first come and rid the world of sin and make Israel's relationship right with God before he restored the kingdom back to Israel. They missed him. How could they have missed him? Because of a misinterpretation of the scriptures. Mm. Have you ever had somebody misinterpret what you said? Maybe it was a text message and they read it wrong or you misinterpreted somebody. You went off on them, right? I see what you said. And it's like, oh, oh, I'm sorry. I actually, (laughs) maybe you said something else. So, So back in the day, I had this telemarketing job, right? And we called for the Fraternal Order of Police, the local FOP. And we were the guys who would call you on the phone for a donation, You ever get those people calling you for a donation? Well, we would call usually around dinner time, and we would usually hear about it too. Why do you always have to call at dinner time? Why don't you get yourself a real job, you know? (laughs) And so we had to have thick skin. But what was funny was before we would call on the phone, we had to go to an extensive amount of training before you could represent the police on the phone. It was a great organization. It still is. They, they call. They raise money for children's programs and things. And, and so, but we had to go through training before we could jump on the phone. And I remember my boss saying, you have to use the authority of a police officer, but at no time are you ever allowed to misre- or to represent yourself as a police officer. So he gave us a demonstration. He said, what's the one thing that you think about when you see blue lights in the rearview mirror? Ticket. Yeah, ticket, fear. Right? Intimidation or whatever. He's like, perfect. You got to use that on the phone. (laughs) So he said, you're not a police officer, but the people will think you're a police officer, but you don't want to say that you're a police officer. So this is the way it's done. You use a good deep voice like an officer would. He said, so they get on the phone and you say, hi, this is Keith. I'm calling for your local fraternal order of... He said, and right before police, you pause, and then you put strong emphasis upon the word police, right? So he said, I'm calling for the fraternal order of police, and then follow up with a firm, how you doing this year? So after he said, you have the people on the other end, and they feel like they're in trouble, and they stole something, then you hit them for the money. I'm like, oh, gosh. Okay, this doesn't feel right, but okay, I'm going to go for it. So a couple months into it, I jump on the phone, and my boss is still standing there. And so I get a man who picks up the phone, and I can immediately tell the poor brother, he, he just doesn't speak English very well. Now, you guys know I'm Spanish, right? So he sounded just like my Uncle Amando, right? Uncle Amando will pick up the phone and be like, Hello? Right? So, so he picks up the phone. <laughs> And I'm like, okay, my boss is standing here. I have to follow through with this call. I don't want to get fired, right? So I said, okay, I'm going to go for it. I said, yeah, hi, this is Keith. I'm calling for your fraternal order of police. How you doing this year? And the man on the other end of the phone, as soon as he heard it, panicked. He said, the police. I said, uh, yeah, and we were trained. You always take it from the top because you don't want to misrepresent yourself, so you have to start over if they ask who you are. So I said, police, and every time I said police, he panicked even more. So he said, the police. I said, yes, I'm calling for the fraternal order of police. He said, oh, no, no, no. I don't know nothing about the, what, what's wrong? And I said, Sir, there's nothing wrong. And so I went to the rebuttal sheet that the company provides for you. In case the call goes south, this is going south real fast. So I go to the rebuttal sheet. I said, yes, uh, fraternal order of police. I said, it's a friendly call, sir. Calm down. It's the police. I said, calm down, sir. And then I I read the sheet. I said, "Uh, put put your hands down. (laughs) 
He said, ah? I said, oh gosh, I don't know what to do. I said, listen, sir. I said, so finally I'm like, well, let me find out if this is even the man of the house, right? Because he might not even have power to make financial decisions and I'm wasting all this time. So I said, I'm looking at my boss, I'm sweating because this man thinks I'm a police officer and, and it's going south and he's afraid and I'm trying to put him at ease. So I said, look, I'm calling for the fraternal order of police. Is this the man of the house? He said, there's a man in the house? I said, no, sir, no, there's not a man in your house. Everything is okay. It's okay. He said, oh, no, I don't know nothing about a man in the house. And so there must have been his wife beside him because she must have said, well, who is it? He said, it's the police. There's a man in the house. I'm like, oh, no, sir, no. What happened there? A misinterpretation of what I said, this man took to the extremes with, there's a man in the house? No, sir, there's no man in the house. Israel took the scriptures with a misinterpretation to extremes. Jesus comes and he steps on the scene and they saw Jesus crucified and said, surely this cannot be the king that was to come because he died. But little did they know that three days later, Oh, man, three days later, the scripture reads that Jesus was resurrected from the dead, and he is seated at the right hand of the Father, who is seated upon the throne, constantly making intercession on behalf for us day and night. Jesus Christ is King of kings and Lord of lords. Hmm. And so in this passage of scripture of Isaiah 9, the prophet says that this king would be a wonderful counselor, a mighty God, an everlasting father, and a prince of peace. Now there have been some scholars who have said that this perhaps is not even speaking about Jesus. That possibly was speaking about King Hezekiah or, or another king during that time. But we're going to look and study the scripture today. Are you guys ready for the word? We're going to study a couple of scriptures and see that when we're speaking about wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting father and prince of peace, that we're speaking about Jesus. Number one, Jesus is our wonderful counselor. The book of Matthew, chapter number 12, and verse 42. Let me read this to you in your hearing. It says this, The queen of the south will rise at the judgment with this generation and condemn it. For she came from the ends of the earth to listen to Solomon's wife, and now something greater than Solomon is here. Now, if you know anything about the Bible and Solomon, Solomon was the king who God appeared to him in a dream and said, ask of me whatever you wish, and I'll give it to you. And he asked for wisdom, and he became the wisest king in the world. As a matter of fact, people were traveling from all over the world to come and hear Solomon's counsel. He was like the Old Testament Google search, right? Anything you asked him, he could tell you. And so the queen of Sheba has come from Ethiopia just to hear Solomon's counsel. And Jesus knew that everybody standing there would know that Solomon was one of the wisest and greatest kings. And he said, there is a greater than Solomon that is standing right here before you. In other words, Jesus is like, who do you think gave Solomon his wisdom in the first place? Jesus is our wonderful counselor. He is our wonderful counselor. A good counselor will allow you to come into his office and perhaps lay on the couch and allow you to say everything that you need to say and hear your problems and your issues and your challenges, and he will compile all of that information and then suggest good counsel to you. But when it comes to the wonderful counselor, he already knows what you're thinking. <laughs> He already knows what you were going to say ahead of time before you tried to formulate the words into a sentence, into a paragraph, to then speak and say, God, you really don't know what I'm going through, but this is what I'm going through. And Jesus is like, listen, I already know what you were going to say. The Bible says that he knows our thoughts are far off. In fact, in Matthew chapter number 9, 
There was a situation that took place. Jesus heals a paralyzed man. And there were some religious leaders around him. And in their heart, not even verbalizing, in their heart, they said, who is this man think that he is? Jesus told the man, your sins are forgiven you and you're healed. And they were like, this is blasphemy for somebody to say that their sins are forgiven. He said, Jesus said that. And so Jesus answers the question without them even asking. He just continues the conversation. He says, what's easier for me to say? Your sins are forgiven or to say, take up your mat and walk. And then he said, so that you know that the son of man has power on earth to forgive sins. He tells the man, get up. Take the mat and head on to the house, right? He knows our thoughts. He is able to provide real counsel in real time for real situations in your life. Jesus is our wonderful counselor that is available 24-7, 365. He's our wonderful counselor. There is no thing that you're going through that he can't counsel you out of. There's no situation in your life that he cannot help you solve. He's got all kinds of ways to counsel you. He can counsel you into a blessing. He can counsel you out of a tragedy into a blessing and have you be in the right place at the right time to say the right things to the right people and give you the right job you weren't even qualified for. You may not have had the experience. You may not have gone to school for it, but because in your counter, in your corner is the wonderful counselor providing wisdom when you need it. Jesus is our wonderful counselor and he is available to you. In fact, in 1 Peter 5, 7, the scripture says, Peter told, he said, cast all of your cares upon him for he cares for you. This is significant because this is Jesus inviting you into his counseling room. He's saying, listen, there's nothing that you would want to say to him that's going to bother him. You're not troubling him. You're not getting on his nerves. He cares about the little things and he cares about the big things in your life. Jesus desires to provide counsel for us. He's our wonderful counselor. Number two. He's our mighty God. Boy, you got real quiet after that one. You guys all right? All right, come on across our campuses. Number two, check this verse out in the book of Luke 1. We're going to look at 30 through 33. This is such a strong verse. Watch this here. But the angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus he will be great and will be called the son of the most high. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David. The throne of who? David. And he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. Now, I want you to see something else in Isaiah 9, 7. Let's just go back to it real quick. Isaiah 9, 7. Watch this. Of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. He will reign on David's throne. So we have the prophet Isaiah in Isaiah 9, 7. He's speaking about a foretelling of the coming king who would sit upon the throne of David. And then we come over here to Luke chapter number 1, verse 30. And the angel of the Lord has come out of heaven and has appeared to Mary, the mother of Jesus. And so we have Isaiah's foretelling of the prophecy and we have the angels speaking to Mary saying, the child that you are about to birth is the fulfillment of what was spoken about 700 years prior. Jesus is King of kings and Lord of lords legally. See, our, Messiah, our, our Lord and Savior is Israel's King and Messiah. Legally. This is why the genealogy of Jesus is so important. You know, like when, when New Year's comes around and you make that resolution... Like, I'm going to read the whole New Testament through in, this, in, in a year or whatever it would be. And you jump down right into Matthew where so-and-so begat so-and-so. Who begat so-and-so? Who begat so-and-so? 
and, and, you, but, and you might fall asleep, but listen, don't fall asleep on that right there because that genealogy that lists that out is actually showing that Jesus is the legal rightful heir to the throne of his great, 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 great grandfather, David. Jesus is Israel's king legally. On Mary's side, his mother, and, his, and Joseph, his, his earthly father, but though we know that Christ came by birth through the Holy Spirit. Jesus is legally the rightful heir to the throne of David. Jesus is our mighty God. Luke 1, 32 says Jesus is the Son of God, but he is also God the Son. He's the second person in the Godhead, which leads me to my third point. Jesus is our everlasting Father. I want to encourage you, if you missed part one of the message that pastor spoke, pastor began to break down the Godhead. So I would encourage you to check out pastor one, uh, chapter, uh, the message number one that pastor spoke, not pastor one, message one. <laughs> Jesus, number three, is our everlasting Father. The book of John, chapter number 14, verses eight through nine. I just wanted to make sure that I provided a, a significant amount of scripture for you so that you can take this when you go home and you can study the scriptures. Amen? John 14, verse 8 says this. Philip said, Lord, show us the Father, and that will be enough for us. And Jesus answered, Don't you know me, Philip? Even after I've been among you such a long time, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Jesus is the ultimate example of the Father. So I had a friend of mine um, in our old church. His name was Tim Burkett. And I remember Tim at Father's Day. Uh, I was speaking to him in church, just light, light talk. H have you ever had just try to have a light conversation with people in church and they go real deep on you? Right? You're just like, hey, how you doing? And they just drop it on you. And like, man, all right. And you just like, like walk away heavy. Well, Tim kind of hit me with one of those. I said, so what are your kids cooking for you for Father's Day? He said, oh, they don't cook for me. I said, oh, you guys going out to eat? He said, no, actually. And then he just laid it on me. He said, I, this is an opportunity to show my children that though as father, I'm the greatest in the house, yet I cook for them to show that I'm the servant of all. I was like, man. <laughs> my goodness. I mean, he just dropped it on me, right? Now, I just got to, I'm not there yet. You know, I, I, I'm not there. I'm not, I haven't cooked for my kids and they probably don't want me to cook for them because it might not come out so well. Their mother is to cook, but, but he just laid that on me. See, Jesus is the ultimate example of the father. When Jesus came to the earth, he came to Israel that was pretty much an upside down kingdom as most earthly kingdoms are today where you have the king on the top and you have the people on the bottom and the people serve the will of the king. But when Jesus came. You know he was a revolutionary. <laughs> Jesus came and turned the thing and made it right side up. And he put the people at the top and the king at the bottom and his disciples couldn't even comprehend it because one day he came to them and he washed their feet. And they were like, Jesus, don't wash my feet. We need to be washing your feet, if anything. And Peter was like, look, if you're going to wash something, wash my head, wash my body, wash my feet, because I have some things going on in my life that I need to be cleansed of. And Jesus said something incredibly important as a leader, as a parent, as any kind of leadership title. He said, whoever wants to be great among you, let him first be your servant. Jesus is the ultimate example of the Father. Let me read a passage of scripture for you. Philippians chapter number two, verses five. Watch this right here. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in the very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even on a cross. Man, that's powerful, isn't it? 
Now, we might as well read verse 9. Watch this right here. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name. Oh, I feel like preaching that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and up under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord unto the glory of God the Father. My Lord, Jesus is the ultimate example of what the Christ life looks like. Living this life for Jesus is what he modeled. He modeled to us humility and servanthood, even though his position was king. Man, that's strong. Here's Parenting 101, because at New Hope, you know we got a lot of babies coming, and we love it. We love it. They are truly fulfilling, populating the earth as was commanded in the book of Genesis. And we love it here at New Hope. Here it is right here. Here's Parenting 101. Here's Leadership 101. And that is, let them see you serve others in humility. And while they're watching you, they will have a blueprint for success in how to live this life for Jesus because of what you have shown them, because what you model is what your children will follow. Jesus is the ultimate example of the Father. And here's one more right here. Let me give it to you. Here's a side note, by the way. This Christmas, you know, have you ever thought how busy God must be? You ever think about how busy God's gotta be? I mean, he, he's the king of the universe. He's running everything. Have you ever considered that when Jesus laid everything aside, what he did is he set it aside and he came and he dedicated his life, his time, his desires all for us. He showed us how valuable we were by what he laid down. I want to encourage you this Christmas to follow Jesus' example. And that is the things that can wait till later, let them wait till later. When your children come and they try to have a conversation with you, set the phone down. Make eye contact with them. Give them your undivided attention. Give your family, give your friends the undivided attention that they desire to have and show them how valuable they are because you gave them your undivided attention. You laid aside that which what you wanted to do because of who they are in your lives. Number four, Jesus is our Prince of Peace. And so as we land the plane in Psalm 91, I want to read something to you. Whoever dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. I would say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I will trust. When we receive Christ in our hearts and in our lives, the Holy Spirit comes on the inside of our lives as a down payment, as proof that we have received Christ. The Holy Spirit comes in our lives. When the Holy Spirit comes in our lives, he doesn't come like Cousin Eddie unannounced, right? When he comes, all the blessings of heaven come with him. We're heirs to the throne. The peace of the Holy Spirit ought to be in our hearts and in our lives because he lives there. I want to ask you a question. Do you have peace with God? Because if you don't, it's made available to you today. When I said in 1 Peter 5, 7, cast all your cares upon him for he cares for you, the Holy Spirit desires to come into our lives. The Father desires for us to come and sit in his lap and hear from the counsel of God. Instead of posting all the things that you're going through on Facebook and on Instagram and social media, post them to God's website. <laughs> Speak to the Lord and say, Lord, I'm going through this and I need you to get me out of this. Go straight to God. He said, the, the, the scripture says, come boldly before the throne of grace in time of need. He's our Prince of Peace and that peace is made available to you. All you have to do is go to God and pray. Go to God, read the scriptures, be in God's face this Christmas. Let the peace of God that surpasses knowledge keep your hearts and minds this year. 
Hey, listen, we've been preaching about the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, and I think it's time that we sing about this King of Kings and this Lord of Lords. Jesus Christ is King. Come on, let's pray together. <clears throat> Father, we give you thanks today, Lord. We thank you that you sent your son Jesus to die upon the cross for us, Lord. We thank you, Father, that we are able to have peace with God. Lord, I pray today, as we go into this Christmas season, Father, we ask in the name of Jesus that the peace that surpasses all understanding, that passes knowledge, would keep us in you. We ask these things in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen and amen. Come on, let's worship today.